The Major Spoilers podcast covers news, reviews, and of course, spoilers, and goes into details about the topics discussed. So if you haven't read, listened, or watched the items we talk about, you might want to come back later. I'm Matthew. I'm Rodrigo. I'm Scott. And I'm Stephen, and you're listening to the Major Spoilers Podcast, the 1,000th episode of the Major Spoilers Podcast. That's right. In this issue, uh, we're pretty much going to have a regular show. We get ghosted, which is a bummer, since I'm not over the girl who ghosted me in 1998. The Witcher's back with a catch. Venom's back with a vengeance. Mary Marvel's back with no alias. And as for the crew, we're back to the future. Back in the high life, back in black, and Backstreet's back. All right, you can guess who's who. But get ready, because we're coming back to your earphones, back to your RSS feeds, and most of all, the major spoilers podcast is back on the air. Welcome to issue 1000 of the Major Spoilers Podcast. Thank you for downloading and checking us out this week. A lot of people, a lot of people over in the Major Spoilers Discord were asking, uh, what are you guys going to do? Are you doing something special for the 1000th episode? Come on. You followed us for 1000 episodes. You know, we that. don't do anything. We don't do anything. We special. never do anything special. Although, I mean, we don't. Milestones. Although, we did, yeah, we did juggle our schedule around quite a bit so that mm-hmm. we could get one Scott Johnson to join us for our 1000. Oh episode. man. Yeah, um, I heard about that. I'm glad you did you get him or what how that worked out. Yeah. We got one. We didn't get the one we wanted, but we oh. got a Scott Johnson. Uh, well, he's actually from Maryland and he's really really in love with the Alpha Romeo spider. So that's oh, kind of I am wonderful. I'm curious Scott as someone who has recorded thousands upon thousands. Of course, we've done thousands upon thousands of episodes too, just spread mm-hmm. out on a bunch of shows, but uh, the Morning sure. Stream for example, you guys are up to what 3000 episodes or something like We're that. Pushing at this point. pushing 3 moment we're almost there i think we're i don't know 50 episodes away is there a reason to celebrate these big milestones do you think or is it just time to just uh you know we made it to 100 episodes that's probably the big place where everybody needs to celebrate and then move on i can that's a great question this reminds me of like uh anniversaries or other big moments in your life well hey let me let me give you a a hint Uh, don't (laughs) don't don't just take your wife out to mcdonald's for your anniversary i I, I know that would diminish yeah. from uh from you know from experience there <laughs> from direct experience yes well i mean in in my case when it comes to shows it does feel like when you hit 50 it's a big deal because it means you've got momentum and you're sticking with it when you hit 100 i think that means you've done it you could stop then and it'd still be okay that's like the that's like a, a run of a successful sh- you know sitcom or television show so i i feel like 100 is like the moment to really celebrate I don't know. After that, it's like, well, what are we, 200? Sweet. What are we going to do? Well, kind of the same show, but maybe we'll play a thing that's, here's our ba- favorite moments of the last 200 episodes. And then you hit 300 and you don't do that. And then you hit 400 and you barely mention it. Mm-hmm. By the time you get to 1,000, I think it is a toot your horn moment for sure. And you should toot yours all over the place here. Um, toot toot. But I also respect this idea of like, but you're also going to do a show, which is why people have tuned in for 1,000 episodes. So, I, yeah, you know. there you go. Speaking of. Where I'm at. Uh, speaking of, let's do some news. All right. Rodrigo, what do we got to, to kick us off this week? Uh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, okay. So, uh, Henry Cavill is back as Superman. Hooray! Uh, yeah, I know a lot of people are excited about that, which is great news for him, but perhaps bad news for fans of The Witcher, as Netflix has recast Geralt of Rivia with actor Liam Hemsworth. Mm. Online comments have ranged from modest grumbling to spitting vitriol. Uh, there's a silver lining to the news. Cavill is still around as The Witcher for the third season, which should release sometime in the summer of 2023. So we still get have a so- whole season coming in of, of Henry Cavill. Yeah, we get to the, see uh, the Witcher. shirtless, hopefully a lot, in this third season of The Witcher. Scott and I talked a little bit about this on Monday. Liam Hensworth has just not got the build. Of a Henry Cavill, not, Scott. Not the, not yet. I mean, he has certainly got the potential for it. His brothers are, well, mainly his brother Chris. His other brother is sort of a schlump, too. But uh, the, the body potential is there. It's entirely possible he's worked himself up to this point. Um, he's a tall guy uh, by Hollywood standards. And so I think he could probably do just fine. I just think that we've got an Internet-centric fan base uh, full of gamers who love the Witcher games, full of people who may have read uh, the books by the Polish author whose name I can't remember, uh, that really, really like Henry Cavill. <clears throat> My big joke has been, uh, 
I haven't seen this much vitriol for Henry Cavill leaving this as I have since he was announced that he was going to be Superman. Yeah. So, you know, you flip the coin one direction and you get vitriol. You flip it the other, you get it there. But, you know, he's beloved. He's a nerd. Builds his yeah. own PCs and, and, and plays most, games. He, and most of all, you should stuff. flip a coin to your Witcher. I agree. Just toss a coin to your Witcher make sure it lands on heads. But the thing, the, the deal for me is I'm a wait and see for almost everything when it comes to casting changes because I... You know, Liam Hemsworth is fine. He's fine. Will he be as good? I don't know. Maybe, maybe better, maybe worse. I just can't tell till he gets here. So we'll let it happen. Yeah, it's not think, a, to me, it isn't a big deal. I think for me, it really comes down to stories because I can see replacing an actor. Oh, that's happened many times. Just watch daytime soap mm-hmm. operas and you'll see actors popping in for other roles uh, on a weekly basis. Sometimes uh, what I'm really going to be interested in is uh, how's the story? Is it done well? Uh, you know, is it, you know, is the acting done well? It doesn't really matter to me who is the face of, of Geralt, uh, as long as, as the story is entertaining and engaging and not just a watered down, um, high fantasy trope. So, uh, that's, well, that's where I sit on this. Rodrigo, you know what I heard? What'd you hear? <laughs> and this isn't this like, so may not so be wrong. Fact. Yeah. Fact. Uh, Henry Cavill has had sort of some headbutts with the writing staff mm-hmm. because he's a as as has been said he's a big fan of the Witcher books yeah and he his idea of who uh Geralt is and the writer's idea of who Geralt is wasn't always the same and like there are like I I saw a video on this and there are like multiple articles basically an article per returning season of Witcher that says Henry Cavill is going to come back as the Witcher with one uh, condition. And the condition is always make this more like the book and potentially less like the game or less like what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, And so people are saying, like, obviously, you know, he got back on Superman. But I think people are saying, like, he might have given him an ultimatum and been like, like, I don't want to keep playing this character if you're not going to make it like the character in the books. Yeah, uh, who is, I guess, more thoughtful and a bit of a philosopher mm-hmm. and stuff. But, you know, I think they're written in either they're written in first person or you get to hear a lot of his inner thoughts. Yeah, I think it's um, written diary that, style. Yeah. And that just is doesn't come across on this in the series. I haven't read them again. This is just sort of like the scuttle. But uh, almost certainly it was because, you know, he got recast as Superman. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have heard many of the same uh, comments from him, and I know that. He's gone on record in a few places talking about yep. about this. So it could also be it could also be that I doubt that unlike uh, the uh, James Gunn news, we didn't talk about that on TMS, Scott, um, uh, the James Gunn news where, you know, he now can't do anything for Marvel. Um, I don't think Henry Cavill coming back as Superman precludes him from doing other other stuff. So, mm. yeah, there we go on that. This was this was interesting to me, though, because it's kind of the flip side of the. The uh, really cool, hey, we're going to stunt cast somebody or we're going to bring back the original actor or, you know, I don't know if you guys ever saw Days of Future Past, which was the X-Men, like the sixth or seventh, I don't know. Yeah, the movie, the movie Days of Future Past brought back, and this was a whole thing in some fan circles, brought back Daniel Cudmore as Colossus. Now, if you remember Colossus from X-Men 2, that's because you didn't blink. He literally did virtually nothing. Yeah. But bringing him back got cheers from certain chunks of fandom because I recognize that character. And I know that, you know, they brought back uh, an 87 year old um, Burt Ward for a cameo in the flashes crisis on infinite earth. And I popped for that, but I also thought afterwards, why, yeah. why, why do I care that an 85 year old man is wearing the colors of Robin and making a cameo in this? And I feel like that, Having Gerald be a different actor now, I think, is going to be something that we're going to see more in our pop culture. Oh, like our a movies. James Bond kind of thing? Yeah, but yeah. also, you know, people I just want to see like, the regeneration scene on YouTube, right. and then I'll decide. <laughs> but people are like, no one will ever be Iron Man after Robert. Yes, there will. No. They'll recast Iron Man. Five years from now, there'll be a new Iron Man. It'll be the kid. Oh, yeah, when they, when they have to reboot. Angle into Iron Man. Yeah, they have to reboot yeah. the Iron Man franchise. So anyway, uh, this past weekend, the 2022 Mike Rear Wingo Comic Book Industry Awards were presented to some very deserving comic series and companies. There were two divisions uh, in the Ringo Awards. First, the fan favorites, which are nominated and voted on by fans. 
and the juried category. Here are a selection of some of the winners from the juried category. Best artist or penciler went to Felipe Andrade. Uh, best writer went to James Tynan IV. Best single issue or story is Something is Killing the Children, number 20, from Boom Studios. Best letterer, Taylor Esposito. And best inker, Sal Buscema. Uh, major spoilers, wishes to congratulate everyone who picked up an award this past weekend. And what I'm thinking, Scott Johnson, is that we need to get you nominated for a fan award. Uh, Jason Inman and Ashley Victoria Robinson have been up for Ringo Awards twice, I want to say, for their <laughs> independent comics. So yeah. I think we can rally all of our listeners, all of your fan base, get you nominated for a Best Artist category, and then get everybody to vote for you to get a, a, a Ringo Award next year. Oh, I'm so Ooh. terrible at the, I'm terrible at asking for votes for anything. I'm so bad at it. It would have to be somebody would have to just do this entirely without my. <laughs> without me doing without anything his knowledge yeah yeah <laughs> I don't, behind his back. <laughs> i'm terrible at this stuff like honestly you guys whenever hear this right he's, he's whenever so we here. whenever we all i hear I'm, is scott johnson saying please everybody please nominate me please do this is that what you're getting out of that <laughs> that's what i'm hearing scott johnson I, I love awards i don't know i hate i hate Too modest i'm a bad listen i don't even know what it is i'm just bad at self-promotion to the point of you know it's detrimental to me uh, that I don't do that very well. So whenever someone else does it, it's great. So, Hey, if y'all want to do it and you think Ringo Starr is my guy, I'm just kidding. If you think a Ringo award is what's uh, right for me, Hey, Hey, get out there and let me know. Rock oh, the vote. We can, we can marshal the, uh, the diamond club, uh, fan base and really rig the, uh, rig Oh the yeah. Base. Those weird, those weirdos like to get all sorts of tomfoolery done. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so uh, really something in killing the children is kind of the big award winner on this because James Tynan is the writer of that series. And I don't remember what specifically uh, Andrade was voted for, but uh, nominated for, but it may have been something is killing the children as well. This is a kind of a horror scary book that's kind of come out of left field over the last couple of uh, years. And I think it's something that we need to take a look at. I know uh, Ingrid, who does a lot of the reviews on the major spoilers website has been reviewing this and has nothing but good things to say. So if people are looking for a new good comic, something is killing the children seems to be a big to do. So there you Ooh. go. All right, Matthew, wrap it up for us. If you're looking for a new big comic that actually became a movie, you should know that after writing and producing the first two Venom movies for Sony Pictures, Kelly Marcel has been hired to direct Venom 3 starring Tom Hardy. Uh, and the voice of whoever does the voice of Venom, which I think is awesome. Marcel is known for writing the screenplay for 2013 Saving Mr. Banks and scripting the first installment of the Fifty Shades of Grey film franchise. Uh, Venom 3 will apparently be her feature directorial debut. Now, after that first Venom movie brought in like $856 million and Let There Be Carnage brought in like $507 million, I think this, you know, people are expecting this to be kind of a big deal. Well, so uh, unlike some franchises which go up, there seems to be a diminishing return from picture to picture and picture in a lot of them. I think the one that's the mm -hmm. exception is the Fast and the Furious franchise goes up and certainly the Marvel franchise movies uh, go mm -hmm. in the opposite direction. Um, but we see a lot of times like Jaws 2 did not do as good as the first Jaws and Jaws 5 did not do as good as the previous ones. It, uh, you know, Let There Be Carnage was directed by, um, was it Andy Serkis directed that one? I want to say. Oh, did he? I think, I think he did. Uh, by the way, Andy Serkis has a great role in one of the Cabinet of Curiosities uh, segments. Uh, oh, so you really? have to go and cool. No, no, I'm sorry. He's in Andor. Sorry, he's in Andor and has a great role in Andor. Um, is he himself or is he covered Andor? in uh, No, he's CG himself. Business. He's himself. Yeah, yeah. It was okay. last week's episode. Um, I can't watch he's, Andor he's, because without butt, we're not in I'm conjunction. Not, <laughs> let, there, let there be carnage. It was directed by Andy Serkis. And also the voice of Venom is uh, Tom Hardy. So there you go. Really? Yeah, yeah. I knew that. That's that Tom, I, knew. I did not know that. I did not see that at all. That's cool. Yeah, he records that separately. But the the uh Vandy Circus, look, if you told me Andy Circus was Caesar in the upcoming Venom movie, I'd be excited. <laughs> <laughs> I anyway. I think that we are probably looking at. I'm just gonna put a, a spitball out there. Depending on how much money Sony Pictures wants to to sell, I'm going to spitball and say that the the third Venom movie will probably bring in a between 250 and 300 million dollars hmm. that's that's my that's my guess that's not a bad prediction given the current market i think that's probably well and i think right. sony also has the stink so that sony has 
two things going for them and uh, against them. The first is the Spider-Man uh, franchise, which, you know, they work in conjunction with Marvel Studios to do that, that third Spider-Man um, multiverse storyline very, very well. And so they earned a lot of, of praise for that. Then they released Morbius. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. and then they Don't thought it was a good idea to release it a second time. It twice, actually. Yeah, they released yeah. it twice. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Venom 3 does, but I'm, I'm looking at it, 250 to 350. So, there you go. Okay. Uh, dear listeners, think, you can, go ahead, Scott. Oh, I was just going to say, I think you're dead on with that number. All that right. Sounds right to me. Uh-oh, yeah. I have a visitor in my room, so hold on just a moment while I chase him Dog. out of here. Do, 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 do. Dog, kid. Either a cat or a child. Could be a cat or a child. No dog. It sounds like a child. It is a cat child. It's a cat it child. Is. Oh, it's a cat wow. child. His name we is call Bruno. Those kittens. We don't you talk about them. Bruno. So those are called you kittens. Get, where I live. Get one of those old oh, man. Uh, middle this, aged man cats. This like cat, get, we yeah, got yeah. him. We got him two months ago. I think it's two months ago now. As a kitten, like a three week old kitten, when we brought him home from the uh, shelter. Shelter cat people, everybody, go get one of those. This cat is the size of a full size cat today. He just chows and chows and chows and gets into everything. And right now I've got to keep him. He is. He just grew in like two months. He's the size of a full cat now. I, you know, uh, he's just huge. Um, they get bigger. Is what I'm, I'm hoping that he doesn't get much bigger. Uh, I mean, a but, boy cat can get pretty big. Yeah. yeah. Well, we know how big Mojo is. And so I expected him to be about as big as Mojo. And he's already after three months as big as Mojo. So. Uh, it's, it's kind of disconcerting, but I got to keep him out of the office because we know what happened the last time we had a cat in the house, a new cat in the house. He chewed up uh, $800 worth of, of, of audio cables. So I'm how, trying to keep him out How old did you say here. the kitty is? He's like two or three months tops. Okay. And he's the, like, of, say the first year of a cat's life is basically their childhood up through adolescence. Oh, I'm sure he's a dumb, so he's a dumb kid like a cat. Year. So yeah, you get to like a year and you've got a 15 year old cat with giant feet yeah. trying well, to figure out. Mojo is, uh, at least at least 10 years old him. So we've yeah. got the young and the old and they just do not get along. They are night and day yeah. as far as Dots is pushing 11. And he and I have a theory of, we just want to come home and sit on the couch and go to bed at a yeah. decent hour. And you know, that's one thing that old middle-aged men and old middle-aged cats have in common. We don't have time for anybody's crap. And I feel like, that's that's why we've bonded recently, the cat and I. Ow. All right. Uh, dear listeners, we wanted you to join the conversation, not about cats, but about all of these news stories and more <laughs> over in our Discord <laughs> server. It. We'll talk Listen, about cats. Uh, you can join the Major Spoilers Discord server for free. We'd love to see you join our growing community of awesome spoilerites. Yes, there will be cat gifts waiting for you when you get there. There's a link in the show notes, so you can just click on that in the show notes. Open up your Discord uh, app, whether it be on your mobile device, your desktop, wherever you may be. And uh, get in there. Say hello. Uh, we had like three new people join in the last couple of days. So welcome to all of the new people. Uh, speaking of some new things that have arrived, new comic books are here and we going to talk about them. But first, let's jump over to Scott. And uh, you watched a horror movie for the spooky season. What did you watch? How was it? Should we watch uh, so, it? Yeah, no, it's a perfect place to bring it up because normally I do like to have a comic I've read, but I haven't had any time this month to read anything new. And... Um, I did. I have continued on my eight billion uh, genies thing, which I love so good. Um, but outside of that, uh, I watched a movie, uh, like you said, a horror movie. They ended up feeling a lot like a comic book in all the best ways. And uh, that movie is Barbarian, which is currently streaming on HBO Max. And the reason I compare it to a comic book is kind of how it's framed. It's sort of told in these three very distinct acts that feel like either chapters or like a trade paperback with three big issues in it. Mm, mm -hmm. And um, structurally it just, the way it breaks and cuts, it wouldn't surprise me. I don't have anything to base this on, but it wouldn't surprise me if the, the writer director uh, is a fan of the, of the format because it felt like it, this was made by somebody who loves comics and maybe horror comics to be specific, but um, it's awesome. And I, it's the one movie it, right now. It's at the top of my list of movies this year. It's my favorite thing I've seen period, not just horror movies, like all movies. And um, I think it's because it's the first horror movie I've seen. in I don't know, feels like decades where I, where I couldn't predict what was happening uh, around the corner. I just didn't know. And I, and I couldn't wait to find out. And when I did, it was satisfying. And then, then they went somewhere else that I couldn't predict. 
And I went, whoa, no, wait, that's not what I thought was going to happen. But wow, are we really? Go- oh, we're going there, are we? Oh no, we're going a different way because I can never predict you, movie. And that was so refreshing. And I don't mean that it's like chaos or uh, hard hard to follow. It's not what I mean. It just doesn't follow any like burned into the wood tropes that horror movies usually work with. And um, if, if anything, it. It, they've, they've done some brilliant misdirects in the film where you think a certain setup is a typical horror movie setup, and then they break all the conventions around it and take you somewhere different than you expected. Such a refreshing thing, given the glut of content we have these days. Nothing feels new that often anymore. And this felt like fresh minute to minute, moment to moment, scene to scene. And I absolutely loved it. For the people it's not for, if you're squeamish about horror movies, it's not that gory of a movie. But it's scary, and there are moments that are like, "Whoo!" I saw it twice, and the second time, I jumped just as hard in a couple of <laughs> moments. Uh, and if you are a fan of the genre, I'm so excited for you to see it, because you'll see it. You'll go in like I did and have some expectations about what you think is going to happen, and you're going to be wrong, and you're going to be delighted that you're wrong. It's, it's, a, it's wonderful, and I hope that dude, uh, who's normally, I, I, can't, I don't have his name handy, Zach but he makes Krieger. There it is, Zach Krieger. He is known for like being a, a small actor on a whole bunch of things, some comedies, a couple of series and other stuff. This is his first writing and directing job for a, fe- a feature film. And it feels like he's, it, you would only expect this either from a seasoned genius or someone who's like some sort of wonderkin just out of film school. I, I, I can't believe what he pulled off for his first big solo project. And Here- Here's a, Here's a quote. Here's uh, a quote. He says, quote, I'm, you were talking about comic books. Uh, quote, yeah. I'm writing an original horror currently, and he's talking about Barbarian. Uh, there are conversations about existing IP franchises that I can't talk about. And then there's a script I wrote before Barbarian that takes place in um, Gotham City. And uh, I actually love, I think that's my favorite thing I've written, believe it or not. So I don't know what's going to happen with it. Nobody from Warner Brothers or DC. Uh, I've talked to uh, anybody about it. I hope to one day, unquote. I'll bet this gets him in that door. I really do. There's no way you don't see this and go, oh, we need to back this ship because it's just, I, I don't know what else to compare this to. Like, I'm trying to think of another time where this has happened where, you know, maybe James Gunn's a, a good example. It's like kind of quiet behind the scenes, did a horror movie or two. Nobody really paid that much attention. And then Guardians, boom, explodes, right? It's just the biggest deal ever. Have you watched, and now Black, he's, have you watched Black Phone yet? Uh, yeah, I like that a lot too. I really. So like I, I wonder, if kind of the same, kind of the same, similar thing. vibe. Um, I would say Black Phone is more predictable in a Stephen King kind of way. Well, it's a mm, Joel Hill, mm-hmm. Joel Hill uh, short story or whatever, yeah, but yeah. um, it kind of has. There's more predictability in that thing. Um, also, there's parts of Barbarian where you think it might be a movie like Black Phone, but then it isn't. Hmm. You, there are times where you're like, is this a creature feature? I don't know. Maybe not. Is it a haunted house? Could be. Well, now I don't know. Like it, it does stuff to your expectations of horror that, that I just feel like people are going to notice. So what I really hope happens, and I'll be shocked if it doesn't, but this, this is like a weird little wake-up call moment for anybody who's looking for that next big thing in either that genre or just in general. You know, Matt Reeves with Batman, and, you know, they saw his work with the... Uh, Planet of the Apes remake things, the the newer ones, and then went, oh, Matt Reeves, hey, Batman, what do you think? You know, like, yeah. I feel like there's a road for that dude, and it just is to nothing but goodness. So uh, that's that's my hope. The only other thing I would say is it's it's really well cast. Um, the acting is impeccable. Uh, one of the Sarsgaard brothers, yes. um, <laughs> ba, uh, Bill, Bill, Bill. P- who, pl- who plays the clown in It, Pennywise the clown, um, is in this. And just know that, just know that he's Pennywise before you go in. It's not, there's no reference to Pennywise. I'm just saying your head, your head space going in will help you enjoy this movie about what you think or do not think Bill Skarsgård's up to. There's also, um, uh, this movie also has Justin Long, who we've seen in a, in a walrus uh, costume. Uh, so yeah, he blew, that. he blew my freaking mind in this because he is so plays against type for him. I, it was no nothing like Mac. you expect. Yeah, he's a, he's I don't know what he is. He's a Linux system. I don't know what he is now. <laughs> and then also, a, it's got Georgina yeah. Campbell in it, who has been Alita Zod in the Krypton TV series. She's been in Black Mirror, and there was one other one that I saw 
that uh, struck me as somewhat pop culture reference, but maybe it's just those two. Uh, She's my favorite f- favorite female heroine in a horror movie, probably since Halloween and Jamie Lee Curtis. Like really? it's that strong of a performance. She's very very good. Everybody's good. Nobody's bad. Nobody phones it in, and they go so many places. I absolutely loved it. So wow. go to be creeped out. Go to be surprised. Go to be impressed. Um, like have, you I was. Seen, have you seen X, Scott? Uh, I did see X. I enjoyed X. Would you say that it's better than X? Oh, yes. Much better than X. And okay. I liked X. I really, really loved X. Yeah. If you, liked X, if you liked X a lot, I mm-hmm. think you are in for a real treat here. Because in a way, X suffers from the problems I'm talking about. They're very good at it, but they nail the tropes that you kind of expect. Like yeah. You sort of know where X is going to go. And it yeah. goes there. It does so wonderfully, but it still goes where you expected. Yeah. I'm just not used to being surprised like this. That's all. But have you cool. seen the prequel to X? Uh, not, not yet. yet. The okay. I hear she's good though. Really yeah, good. It there. just came out like this week. Eh? Yeah, no, I think it was last week. It's been sitting on my iTunes uh, thing to to watch. So yeah, all right. She plays well, the younger version of her character in the other movie, right? Mm-hmm. That's the deal. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. This is how she got started. Kind of like wasn't the Texas Chainsaw Massacre two basically the prequel to Texas Texas Chainsaw Massacre? I think you may be thinking of Texas Chainsaw Massacre three, but I oh maybe that's don't. what it is. I don't recall. To be there honest. are so many of those. They keep rebooting it. Who I knows? stopped watching after the one with Renee Zellweger. So, all right. Oh, uh, well, let's uh, let's, let's look at some comic <laughs> books coming out uh, today. Actually, uh, as of this recording from DC Comics, new champion of Shazam. It's not Billy Batson anymore, uh, Matthew. It's somebody else. No. And and Darla's in trouble. It's Billy's twin sister. Well, I shouldn't say twin because. <sighs> they reset the universe. But Billy's elder sister, or in this case, technically Billy's elder foster sister, Mary, is now the primary champion of Shazam because at the end of Teen Titans Academy, something, something, Billy's trapped on the Rock of Eternity. Um, so Mary in issue one was set to go off to Vassar, leave her family behind, go off and be an adult and build her own life. And then her parents went missing. So she has had to come home to four or five of her uh, siblings because, again, Billy trapped on the rack of eternity. But uh, the rest of the Shazam children are all at home. Mary has come back and tried to investigate it. And she right now is the only one with Shazam powers. And so she has gone public and the Internet is very unhappy. And on the one hand, I really kind of like how accurate all of the uh, comments and all of the stupid things that the people on the Internet are saying about Mary. But I also kind of feel like (sighs) they're too accurate and they make me sad. But (laughs) she's trying to put her life together, trying to be the new superhero of Philadelphia and also trying to figure out who has kidnapped her parents. And throughout this issue, she's doing a little bit of investigation and a little bit of accidental tripping over things. And they do one thing that I really, really enjoy. Uh, They do introduce the post flashpoint version of uncle Dudley Marvel, which fits perfectly into the storyline ties into everything. And I kind of hope we see him again. And it's not just like a, a quick, pulse of hey here's a thing you know uncle dudley haha you guys remember 1945 we don't either but the end of the issue is the surprising part and we do run into a couple of villains who are magic question mark uh the one thing this issue does lack is hoppy who has been a a large presence in issue one and two and we're never sure whether hoppy is real or not but hoppy is in fact a real like actually live action. I, that's, live action is not the word that I'm looking for, but a, like a, a, a well-drawn actual rabbit who talks to Mary magically. Uh, Doc Shaner handles the art on this. And I've got to say, this book is so good looking. This is a really, really pretty book, but it's also a really well-constructed story. Uh, Part of a sequence takes place where Mary is in the subway, something happens and she has to leave. And what we cut to is a wide shot looking down the subway stairs and the turnstiles. And you just see this lightning bolt whoosh going away. It's the way people should draw, but don't draw the flash. But as the issue ends, yes, 
Darla is in trouble. And of course, you may remember Darla. She's like a seven-year-old girl who used to be one of the many Captains Marvel. Um, there is one major complaint about the new champion of Shazam that I'm hoping is going to be a plot point in issue four. And that's the fact that Mary doesn't have an alias. And so the internet is calling her girl Shazam, calling her lady Shazam, calling her lady lightning, which is a terrible name. And the fact that Billy became the Shazam post flashpoint is, you know, a sore spot for many fans. I, I, I try not to get hung up on it, but I just, I want characters to have a name. I want them to have a name. That's why I didn't like having seven Marvel children because they didn't have a name and you can't just call somebody Darla Marvel. She needs to have a name or else she's you know, literally giving away whatever the secret identity is. Secret identities aren't a thing anymore, but new champion of Shazam four slices of meatloaf, very well done book. And I feel like it's that rare balance uh, between new kind of postmodern comics that take, you know, realism and metatextuality and all of these external forces and also try to put together something that you could see C.C. Beck putting together in 1945. And they do that really well. It's well written. It's well drawn. It's a comic book for Slice of Me Loaf. All right. Very good. That's out uh, today, uh, right now from DC Comics. Yep. You can go get it at your local comic shop or on the Comixology link in the show notes. Uh, out on Wednesday from Dynamite Entertainment, it's Vampirilla versus Red Sonia number one. And, um, you know, Project Superpowers was definitely a thing. I really got this, uh, got a kick out of uh, Dynamite saying, let's take all of these um, uh, properties there where the copyright has expired and let's use them in a comic book series. And I thought that was really great. Uh, I thought that was really unique and a great way for Dynamite to create its own superhero universe. And then somewhere along the way between Project Superpowers and Vampirilla versus Red Sonia, uh, Dynamite decided to create its own multiverse, which I think they call the Project Verse. I don't know exactly what it's called, but this is where we get the multiple Red Sonias, the multiple Vampirillas, the uh, the different uh, Green Llamas from different uh, different Earths, those kinds of things. And Vampirilla versus Red Sonia is more of a crisis on infinite project superpowers is what it, it really feels like because this first issue, uh, a new recruit is coming on board project superpowers and, uh, she's from one earth or one, uh, timeline or I, I'm just going to call a multiverse. Um, and some catastrophe is happening. Something is destroying, uh, one of the, one of the, the verses, the one where is it? I think it's from where the Patriot, uh, comes from. And, it looks like the last transmission they had that it may be some kind of a demon. Well, they have a version of Vampirilla locked up in a uh, cellar down in the basement and Red Sonia uh, is there to interrogate her and she thinks it's all magic. So therefore, because Vampirilla is a vampire, she's all about magic. So she must be behind this. No, that's not the case. Everybody goes to this new dimension and they're ready to take on whatever is there. I'll be honest. I haven't been following what's been going on in the dynamite multiverse, nor have I been really following what's been going on with project superpowers since that first or second project superpowers run. That's not to say that this is a mess because if you have been following that, I think you're really going to get a kick out of the story. It is it's from Dan Abnett. So it's extremely well-written. I think that there is a bigger plot that if you follow this, you will see exactly where all of the, uh, story point parts are going. Part of me feels like this is dynamite poking fun at both Marvel and DC and their big multiverse events. Uh, but at the same time, falling into the same trappings of, Oh, I guess we need to do a multiverse ending event. I don't know. Um, there is no Vampirilla versus red Sonia stuff in this. There's no them duking it out or anything like that. Unless you count them yelling at each other about, uh, how you're an evil uh, magician. No, I'm not shut your mouth uh, as, as fighting. Um, I think this is incredibly well drawn. Uh, Alessandro, uh, Rinaldi is the artist. I think it's great. I think it's written very well. It's just not for me, uh, at this point, just because I have to go back and kind of catch up on what's been going on. But if you understand the tropes of a multiverse ending event, I think you can get into this with very little effort. They do their best to try to explain what's going on. Uh, I still think it's very well put together, even though it's not for me. I'm going to give it four slices of meatloaf out of five. Go into it. If you've not read any of the project superpowers, and you don't know what uh, public domain characters are like. 
you can you can find that out here just a little bit. I think it's I think it's very fascinating when when they do the the uh, public domain characters. It can be a lot of fun. Um, I don't know if I can use the green llama in something, but maybe I should. I don't know. You can. Actually. I will. Green llama is entirely open source. I probably will then. All right, let's wrap up our comic book reviews, Rodrigo, by jumping ahead like Rodrigo always does a week from now. Something to look forward to on November 9th. Yeah, November 9th. That's coming up or already happened, depending on when you're listening to this yeah, podcast. Yeah, hello, future people. Uh, hope your election went well in the United States. Oh, Lord. Okay. You um, said it. <laughs> traveling to Mars number one. Uh, you will be uh, interested uh, once we're uh, in, in that uh in that election, pool, to know that this uh this comic takes place in uh, the <laughs> waning days of western civilization uh it's, it's kind of so how... it's very so current. it's so it's very yeah. much november 9th of yeah it's uh they're they're like uh they're really really kind of giving us uh something like they're really they're being really optimistic cuz i think it takes place in like 2047 or something like that um so uh traveling to Mars is the story of a man who uh is hired to take a trip to Mars so that he can claim Mars um and so that the people that he's working for will have a claim to Mars's resources which are uh, in the in the story are uh, supposedly they have discovered like vast amounts of um, natural gas below Mars's uh, uh, surface. So uh, this character is not like a, a cool os- astronaut guy. It's not like a scientist. It's actually a like pet store manager. And the reason for that is that the it's a race they're they're trying to get to mars and claim this place but everybody else is working on a project that will be able to get someone to mars and back but these guys the the employers of of this person uh are like what if we only had to go one way so this character uh is the main character uh roy livingston um is terminally ill and so he is not expected to come back from Mars, so they only have to get him there. Um, if that sounds weird and depressing, it is. This book is... Uh, this entire first issue is a uh, sort of diary-style telling of this story from Roy's point of view. And he is dying, and the it's... Uh, he says that so is our world. Um, and I think that we're supposed to take that at face value and be like, okay, things are really bad and not just like, you know, this is like, you know, a cancer patient or, you know, somebody who is like, has been diagnosed with a terminal illness, like thinking about what the world is like, right? Because even at the best of times, if you're in that situation, you might think that the world is not great, right? So, but but I think we're supposed to sort of get that, yeah, things are actually pretty bad everywhere. Um, it's depressing. Uh, the art is really good. Um, <laughs> like, by the end of this, you, you figure out where the uh, hat comes from, but the main character is, like, introduced to us wearing this, like, weird, like, Stevie Ray Vaughan-looking hat. Um... And it's like, why? Why is the astronaut this guy, right? And so, getting to that is is interesting and it's fun. Uh, but again, it's kind of uh, at best mellow and at worst, like kind of actively depressing. So I wasn't into it. Uh, not that things need to necessarily be one hundred percent upbeat or whatever for me, but uh, there is a strong current in. Definitely in social media, also in you know media media of a of things being like hopeless and of you know people just being bad and there's nothing we can do about it uh, and this kind of taps into that and I don't like it I don't like that stuff 
Um, I think that uh, there's always something you can do, at least in some way, to make things better, if not for you, then for other people. Um, so reading this, I'm like, well, I, I think philosophically, this book could turn around and be a hopeful book. Um, but right now, as it stands, it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. Well, um, uh, you know, it's written by Mark Russell. And mm-hmm. Mark Russell has a tendency to bring a lot of horrific current events into mm-hmm. his yeah. books. And he's very divisive, especially what is his, uh, what's his Jesus Christ uh, comic book that he did. Uh, uh, what is it? Last Savior? Or Savior? Second Coming. Yeah, Second Coming. That's it. That's it. Uh, that one has gotten a lot of people's attention. Certainly what he did with the Flintstones and uh, oh. others. Uh, he, uh, yeah, he likes to pull people's strings. I, and he, sure. honestly, I think he's trying to do what you said. It's too much of a reflection of reality. But I also think that he likes to poke the bear. And the yeah. bear are so, fans. So, uh, yeah, there's stuff in here for you. If what you, if you, what you like is uh, to, to re- read Mark Russell's work and be upset about it, then there's a book for you. Um, if you, uh, if you can take the, uh, the bleakness of it, uh, you might enjoy this. The, again, the main character is interesting because he's not an astronaut. He's not a scientist. He's not anybody that you would expect to be on a mission to Mars. Uh, so that is interesting. That makes, there's like a fundamental thing about the book that is interesting. Um, but I'm going to give it two and a half slices of meatloaf. Art is great. Uh, absolutely nothing wrong with the book, but just not something that I would pick up again, you know, unless a month from now I'm scrambling and be like, I got to do, do something for the show, <laughs> which has been known to happen. A month from now, when I start giggling, when you say issue two. Yeah. Traveling. That's Mars. fine. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Rodrigo, for that. And Matthew, and of course, Scott with Barbarian. Um, here's the thing. We like spooky stuff during spooky season. Ooh. And for the last couple of months, Uh, We have a special podcast that we release that you can go check out. All the episodes are out now. It's called The Dunwich Horror. Uh, It is a project that uh, Dr. Bradley and Will and I started way back in 2018. And this summer, I finally had free time to sit down and edit uh, this this book narration. The entire thing is out there. We've been releasing it one chapter a week for the last 10 weeks. It finally concluded last week. And I think it's a really good deal. Um, Of all the Dunwich Horror stuff that is on the Apple Podcasts, We are certainly number one uh, in that category. We've got nothing but positive feedback from a lot of people. And the only comment that I've had is I wish that we could listen to this all in one go, because uh, as it's released in chapters, there's a bit at the beginning that, you know, is your basic show open. And then there's the credits at the end of every chapter. And so if you're listening to it all the way through and you want to listen to each of those chapters back to back to back, then you're going to hear me do the intro and the outro and all that stuff, uh, as well as, as Dr. Bradley will doing a fantastic job of reading the Dunwich Horror. However, released on October 31st, Halloween, we released an entire file of the entire reading with no interruptions. So it just goes from chapter to chapter to chapter. It's one nice long reading of the Dunwich Horror. And if you like that cosmic horror stuff that HP Lovecraft brings you, you can get that when you join our Patreon community because we released it there for everybody. So if you want to get in on that action, all you need to do is become part of our major spoilers community. And we want to thank everyone who's part of the major spoilers community, especially our Patreon community. And this week we're welcoming our newest member to the Patreon club. It's Michael Cassidy who signed up today. So thank you, Michael Cassidy for the, uh, for your efforts and joining our community and our Patreon club. We are waiting to give you dear listener a shout out on the show. All you need to do is join us at our Patreon club, patreon.com slash major spoilers. So there you go. That's what you need to do. If you find, if you like Scott Johnson being here and you want to see him come back again and again, join our Patreon <laughs> community so we can raise enough funds to bring That's him right. here because uh, this time next year when he's a Ringo award winner, uh, we are not going to be able to, to get him yeah. on the it's show. Agent, He's just going to be too much in demand. Gonna, yeah. yeah. What Stephen is saying is if you like Scott Johnson, it'd be a shame if anything was to happen to him. Yeah, exactly. It'd be a shame if anyone voted for him for a Ringo Award. Plus, I have been drumming like crazy just to try to keep up with the competition so I can t- get that Ringo Award. I mean, it is a drumming award, right? That's the deal. <laughs> right, yes, right, right. It, it used to be the Mickey Dolan's Award. But, oh, all right. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a, you know what? Rightfully named. He's still right. with us, so 
Yeah, yeah. that's true. Too, oh, too now soon. that you mentioned it, way to go, Scott. <laughs> Let me guess. You also right. talked about Jerry Lee Lewis this past week on your yeah, podcast. We did. And then he yeah, died. I mean, he was a butt. He was a butt. Well, so. that's true, too. But and so the, yeah. for those of you who don't know what we're talking about on the morning stream, uh, Scott Johnson and Brian Ibbett will say, oh, is so-and-so dead? Oh, it looks like they're still alive. And within like two weeks, that person's dead. Yeah, so, it keeps yeah. happening. We really shouldn't do it because we got Betty White that way. We didn't. I mean, she, you know, whatever. I'm sorry. Did you just say to me that you have cursed Mickey Dolenz? <laughs> no, I well, don't know. You didn't say anything on the morning stream. There, so. are, there are only yeah, four show. things that will get me out of this chair. Two of them involve yeah. creamed filling. So <laughs> do All not right. curse the last surviving monkey because i will no, so it has to be really, i won't do it it has to be okay. on the morning it show has, it has to be on the so morning stream first of all and second of yeah, all yeah. it has to be like oh have you heard about the monkeys oh no i've never heard about the monkeys uh the mickey dolan's guy wait is mickey dolan's still alive let's look it up yeah, oh yeah mickey dolan's is still okay. alive yeah <laughs> Steven then, knows the exact he knows the, the i've etymology been listening the to thing. the morning stream since the beginning i'm on every monday you guys can go check it out i'm on every monday to talk about pop culture and geeky stuff but yeah. uh, occasionally, if you listen to it, you will hear Scott Johnson curse a famous celebrity and uh, yeah. curse them to death. So there yeah. you go. And it's, yeah. it is a thing. Everybody knows about it. So uh, hope that your name is never mentioned in a casual, is he still alive kind of way on the morning stream. <laughs> I kind of hope that no one ever says that. About me. <laughs> I really feel like you either know I'm alive or you just don't care. Mm. Uh, that's mm. heartfelt. That's heartfelt. Yeah. Well, sure. you know what happens when you do die? Depending on, you may end up in a uh, creepy hotel in Los Angeles, which brings us to our trade paperback uh, suggestion this week. Ghosted in L.A. Volume 1 from Cena Grace and Siobhan Keenan. That is the best Steven transition ever. I'm so good at that. That is wonderful. Oh, it's, it's my uh, stock yeah. and trade. Yeah. Hire me to do your transitions, you die, people. Your soul goes up on the roof. Hire I'm me to, be to become your, your, your transition guy. Nice. Um, so anyway, Ghost in L.A. tells the story of Daphne Walters, who moves to Los Angeles from Minnesota, Montana. I forget where she comes from. It's an M state. Yes. From uh, Mitsula, our friend who is a Vegas bookie. And uh, she moves to Los Angeles to follow her boyfriend, Ronnie, only to find out that he's gay and doesn't want to have anything really to do with her except maybe be a friend. And now she has nobody she can connect with. Her roommate, uh, so uh, Daphne is Jewish. Her roommate is Catholic, question mark. Um, and uh, I think her roommate is a cultist, I do. I don't know if she's a cultist or if she is, I don't know. There's some things that that give me some bad vibes about that girl. Uh, but yeah. she doesn't feel welcome in her dorm. She doesn't feel welcome with her ex-boyfriend. She's She doesn't know anything about Los Angeles. And so uh, one night she stumbles upon uh, Mycroft uh, Manor. And, or I'm sorry, not Mycroft, Rycroft Manor. And she discovers it's inhabited by ghosts. And these ghosts are going to allow her to live there, provided that she follows their rules. And of course, she proceeds to break every single one of those rules, because as we all know, college age kids uh, think that they are the center of the universe and that they don't have to do anything their elders tell them to do. You know, I knew you in college. I followed the rules in college. You duh. I did. I showed up to class on time. I didn't back sass anybody. Uh, I got along with everybody. Uh, so yeah, this he is. Didn't. He told all the ghosts where he was going and where he right. was. Right. If, if they needed me to, notes. if they need me to run an errand for them, I would do that. If they needed a chicken leg or something, I would bring them the chicken leg. All that stuff. Never I never burned. <laughs> I never burned any sage in their presence. None of that stuff. You mean like a like a single chicken leg? Yeah, that, like right. your wife is from uh, uh, Louisiana, right? Doesn't she know all yeah, about the? Well, yeah, but they don't. It's a turkey leg normally. Oh, is it a like turkey a, leg? I don't know. Yeah, like I, a single yeah, chicken like a, leg. Yeah, because like Henry, Henry, Henry VIII started it. Henry VIII. No, 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 I'm talking like, about when you're doing yeah. the yeah the voodoo magic like for a ritual. Yeah, for you're ritual. Talking Santeria. Yeah, yeah, Santeria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, killing the chicken stuff. So none of that happens in this book. Um. And with good reason. <laughs> is there good reason? Because I think that Daphne's roommate, you may be right that she, she comes That's off a as cult. a good, maybe Catholic girl question mark, but she's, she's always watching like homosexual videos, guys making out videos on her laptop. Mm -hmm. And then everybody has their thing. No, no, no. I'm just saying. And then she's, they have a, supposed to be a prayer meeting 
that Bible Daphne study. interrupts Bible study. Yeah. And I think there's something going on. I'm not saying sexually, but I'm just saying there's something <laughs> weird going on with all of those girls in that, in that group. And maybe it'll come out as the series progresses. The series I think is over. Uh, Ingrid, uh, again, read this uh, series uh, for the major spoilers website and highly recommended this uh, volume only connects the first four issues of that. But Daphne's having, I mean, I think as an act one, we see her having some adjustment issues, Scott. And, and that's kind of interesting to see. I'll tell you what's more interesting than that. Okay. And that is that, um, you guys are going to love this when you okay. sent me uh the doc and you yes. said uh here's the link to the trade ghosted in la and i click it it takes me to ghostbusters crossing over oh no i gave oh, you the wrong no. link and so, so read i read, ghostbusters, uh, crossing I read ghostbusters crossing over thinking that was what i was meant to read oh, and no. so i have i have a little or nothing to add to this particular review, that's just other know, than to say, I, like, I like Ghostbusters. It was good. Did you? Because, it. Mo- because most of us really did care for it. I, I, you know what my problem with it was? Is it looked like the old animated series, which I don't like, mm-hmm. and that threw me the whole time. Just the art style. Uh, yeah. But the story's fine. It's not. It's nothing to write home about. But it's, it's all right. <laughs> That's Anyways, a big sorry. Hello Future People moment for everybody who listened last week and was wondering what would Scott have said. There it is, friends. <laughs> That's yeah, so I, I, well, I didn't know until fault. this very moment that when you mentioned it, and as soon as you said it, I went, that's not the name. All right, then we're going to try to convince Scott to go and read Ghost in L.A. since he's too busy to read uh, comics. He's really busy <laughs> I'll do now. that. I'd love let's, to do that. Let's convince Scott to either read Ghost in L.A. or avoid Ghost in L.A. Oh, okay. Let's hear it. What do you guys Okay, I'm, so and I'm then here. you can tell us, Scott, if you're convinced one way or other. So here's my okay. take on this story. I find it very fascinating because it's slice of life. It's a girl out of water and she's in a in a place that she doesn't know much about and she has a lot of growing up to do. There feels like she has some um I don't want to say entitlement issues, but she feels somewhat I should be the center of attention, and turns out she's not the center of attention. So she has to deal. Spoiled. Yeah. So she has to deal with some of that as she is coming along and figuring out what to do um, in L.A. at this uh, art or at college. Uh, she goes to Long Beach, uh, California State University at Long Beach and what she's supposed to do with her life. So I kind of dig that aspect of it because I deal with kids that are in these situations all the time. Now, I don't deal with kids that, that deal with ghosts all the time. And I like kind of what is going on with the ghosts because they're from all different time periods. Uh, going all the way back to the early days of of Hollywood, all the way to someone who died. Well, by the end of this volume, someone who just died a few days prior, the day prior. And um, they each have different powers. Like one person can uh, possess you. Another person can walk outside the Rycroft Manor grounds. Another person is a ghoul that eats uh, humans. Uh, you know, so everybody has their different powers. And I want to see how this all comes together and whether Daphne has... Um, Daphne has a chance, you know, to see her story come to a conclusion in a satisfying way. Mm -hmm. I like the story as it's written. I think the art is cute. Uh, It is a very cutesy uh, YA kind of art, uh, approachable art style. There's nothing horrific or scary in it, uh, as you may have seen in some of the other comics that we were talking about uh, today or some of the other movies that we've talked about today. I mean, there's a scary moment where one of the ghosts tries to kill Daphne is going to eat her because he she makes too much noise. Um, and it's enough to raise the dead. Wow. I see what I did there. Um, so from that standpoint, I like the first volume. I'm disappointed that boom studios decided to release the, the first volume as a four issue miniseries or as a four issue trade. I really feel like this should have been eight issues. I think the entire series is only either 10 or 12 issues. Um, so I kind of wish that they had been able to break this up into a larger trade. Cause I wanted to read more of this. So my my argument, Scott, is that I think you would check it out. I think you would get a kick out of it. For those of you who've never been to L.A. and want to do things in L.A., in the single issues, uh, Cena Grace went in and said, oh, if you are looking for art places to go to, like the museums that Daphne goes to, here are some really cool art museums in L.A. that you should go check out. Here are some really cool um, alternative places in L.A. to check out, like Silver Lake and a comic shop near Silver Lake. If you've seen the movie, uh, under Silver Lake with Andrew Garfield, four of the places that she mentions in that particular issue are key locations in the Under the Silver Lake movie. So you can go check that out. So I kind of dug that. So I think if you are someone that is YA, someone who's into art, someone who's into 
maybe I think this turns out to be maybe more of a romance comic than a um, horror comic. I think you'd get a kick out of this. So my my suggestion is a thumbs up. I like this comic book okay. a lot. I had very little, very little to complain about. You've uh, I feel like you've done a pretty good job. Okay, let's hear from uh, Matthew yeah. Peterson. Perhaps he has a okay. different take on let's Ghosted go. in L.A. I don't know if I have a different take necessarily than I feel like maybe um, the main character is a little bit more uh, sympathetic and I think a little bit more complex than at least it felt like you were saying. The thing that I both love and hate about this is that she feels like a real 19, 20 year old person. And, you know, she feels like somebody who's trying to figure out who she is. And you do have several points where someone actually comments, hey, you're really good at adapting and acting like the people you're around, which I think is part of the reason why the ghosts are attracted to her. I do love the fact that it basically the whole time I'm just like, OK, so this is like this is the mansion from Sunset Boulevard. And Aggie is totally Norma Desmond, right? Everybody else sees that. It's not just me. Is it me? I think it's just me. It's me. Okay. But I mean, I, because I, number I like one, that. Maggie would not. So Maggie created this hotel to be a home for Aggie. young actresses. Aggie. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Aggie. Um, Norma Desmond would totally not do that. Norma Desmond would have the police <laughs> locked up and say, get away from here. So, and then she'd have a body floating in the pool too. So. Yeah. Right. But I mean, she's, she's got some similarities in the way that she yeah. interacts with the world. Yes. Maybe I found it. I found it likable. I also found that I liked it a little less because generally speaking, when we do um, these particular trade paperback reviews every week on the major sports podcast, check it out on the show. You're very listening to, I read the book. I kind of chew on the book a little bit. Then I go and I do my, my backstory research. And I liked this better before I realized that the writer whose name isn't necessarily gendered is in fact a man. And I'm like, I don't know why I liked it better when I thought that it was written by a woman. Oh, yeah. Maybe I, I didn't realize it either. I may have been just misgendering yeah. as well. So apologies. Yeah, that's OK. Um, and I, I believe it's pronounced Cena. Um, mm-hmm. I know Cena is uh, one of the I, I know them from Power Rangers, the Power Rangers franchise at Boom. But they were also an editor for a long time at Skybound. And for some reason, coming out of this. And then finding that out and then going through for my secondary, you know, just check through read to make sure that I didn't miss things that I was all over the place. It did feel different. Um, I do like the arc of these first four issues. And I feel like if you had to break it in a weird place, this is an okay place to break it because they do have kind of one of the back burner bubbling plots that does come to a head and get resolved at the end of issue four. But I agree with Steven that it probably should have been a longer trade. And if you're going to pick it up, I feel like you should go with a longer trade, but moreover, I think you should pick it up with a couple of caveats. It is very much a young adult series. This is very much, you know, aimed at to me, I'm feeling like this is aimed at, People who aren't quite college age, but would really like to be like, you know how the readers of 17 magazine yeah, aren't this, 17. They're this 14. Feels like a, yeah. This or, feels like a, a middle age to YA. Uh, target. Yeah. That said, I feel like it hits really well, even as, you know, an old, old, old do as, you know, the representative of uh, generation X, I feel like there's still enough universality in this and that feeling of, I'm out on my own and I have to figure everything out. And there are all of these influences on me and some are good and some are bad. And sometimes people are complicated and I get wrapped up in my own head and worry about, Oh my God, did I do this? And it turns out, no, I didn't do this. They don't even care about me, which somehow makes it worse. Um, But yes, I think that it's definitely a check it out book. And I think that the way the art kind of evolves throughout the series is nice because by the end of issue four, we do get a moment that almost feels like a traditional comic book uh, protagonist moment, not necessarily superhero, but this a, a moment that says, this is my story and my book, which at the beginning of issue one would never 
have felt really good. And, you know, the, the short journey that she takes in the, I think it's like a week or a week mm-hmm. and a half. Yeah. She's there for, a short you know, time. It, it definitely does feel like she's making a decision and, you know, coming to terms with, and maybe kind of owning whatever her identity is going to be, or at least owning the fact that she's ready to try and, you know, address that. And I do feel like it's beautiful. I really, really like this art. It feels, you know, very somehow light and young and fresh, but it also has really strong storytelling and it has moments in it that, you know, I'm old. So if I'm like, Hey, who's a, who's a, an artist that I would compare this to, I would actually compare this to uh, Bob Powell who died in like 1957, but was really, really excellent at storytelling was really great at layouts and was really, really excellent at moments where say somebody's coming into a room and they, we have to do, this person is opening a door and walking into a room. How do we make that exciting? Bam, totally pulled it off. And I feel that if you can do that, if you can have somebody walking into a room, feel really good, really strong, really dramatic, like Siobhan Keenan does. And you have a story that kind of resonates even with somebody who's nowhere near your target audience. I think you got a winner. All right, Scott, there's the second, second pitch to you. Hmm. I mean, I feel like an honest, uh, straightforward presentation that has me, uh, slightly more willing to see it after hearing it, even beyond what Steven did. I was already sort of fishing my wallet out. Now I'm lifting it toward the counter i might <laughs> I might grab it all right I so need to hear one what, more though okay rodrigo it's up to you either you're going to close the deal for scott or he's going to flip through it and put it you back up on the shelf it. you gotta wreck it uh well scott and by the way i feel like we should just do all our reviews this way from know, here right? on out I whether know, it's crazy or not I agree. like well scott you see i think we should just uh, bring in a guest a guest each week and we just pitch the trade to them, them and tell yeah, them whether sell they them should the trade. or not. So That's amazing. There you go. This is what happens on episode 1000, a whole new change <laughs> to the major <laughs> spoilers podcast. I think we need to get Brian in, but oh no, next week is Rand is on the show oh. from Ookla the Mock. I think we need to get uh, Brian Ibbett on the show and we'll get some other people on the show. Each week we'll just pitch a new trade to each one of them. So, all right, <laughs> Rodrigo. And, and that'll attract more guests because they won't have to have read the trade. I know, right? They just have to show up and listen to us talk. Uh, oh, that's good. I like You're it. You're genius, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, genius. for your genius idea. For our life-changing, our genre-changing <laughs> new format here at Major Spoilers. Yeah, it's seismic, really, this change. At yeah, episode yes. 1000, yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, I'll say, uh, I will definitely say that I second or third i guess depending on how much praise there was uh siobhan keenan's art it's really excellent um the characters are like super expressive it's like it's cartoony but you know everybody has you know human proportions um the characters are like attractive to look look at not not like necessarily they're like attractive people but they're cute and they're energetic in in like the lines and everything um, and of course, some of them are ghosts, so there's also some like ethereal stuff going on with that as well. Um, as far as the story, it's, I, I mean, it does kind of feel like there needs to be like a little bit more here. Um, but I liked it okay. I, I, honestly, the weirdest thing about it is that this really felt like it was building up to be a sort of like a social consequence type of story right Mm, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you if you watch you know a play or a or or a show or whatever and it's like nobody's ever gonna pull out a gun no one's ever gonna like do anything like that it's just about like somebody getting fired or being excluded from a friend group or whatever and i thought that's what this was gonna be like but just with ghosts Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Probably about halfway through, somebody goes, turns out there are ghosts that can eat people. I am one of them. (laughs) And I was like, what? And the best part about that was that um, I accidentally skipped issue three and went to issue four. Mm -hmm. And that was already happening. And I was like, what? And then I realized what happened and went back and read through it. But it like even even if you just arrive at it properly, like especially when you see the the um uh the way that that 
uh, that that situation is concluded, it's like, oh, no, this is like, there's more stuff going on here than just like, here's, I, I, I have a conflicting group of friends and some of them are dead, right? Mm-hmm. Um so that's interesting, but also I I guess I was kind of looking forward to uh just like yeah, just a social book, a book in which like it's like, oh, this character's not out of the closet. Like I can mm-hmm. tell is like, hey, you should bring him over so, so I can talk to him, kind of mm-hmm. stuff. You know, like yeah, like that. And it's like obviously there's like inherent social risk in that, and also they are ghosts. Um <laughs> but, but the fact that there might be like more going on here, that something is actually sinister going on with the ghosts. Um I which mean, is yeah, because there's there's like some, that multiple times. I mean, there's some scary moments, right? So not only do you get the ghast who's trying to eat a Daphne, but you have Aggie dispelling him, just right. basically exactly. like get out of here. But then she also sends Daphne on some quest to a cemetery, which the last name of the grave she's visiting also happens to be the last name of one of the ghosts in the in the right. motel and, or in the manor. And actually, he he brings it up. the The ghoul brings it up. He says, mm-hmm. "What about what about like so and so's son? Like because they've had mortal tenants before, and mm-hmm. so and things have happened to them, but we don't know what mm-hmm. it is. So I guess Scott, if that if you find that uh, sort of suspense interesting, then you can start it out here, but it's not resolved in this volume." Uh, mm-hmm. But but it does start there, so, so I, I guess have to have some faith in the, yeah. in what's to come. Okay, yeah, I, I guess that's that that's kind of what it boils down to for me. I was like really settling into like a college, uh, um, slice of life. Yeah, college yeah. slice of life thing, but with like ghosts. Age story with ghosts. Yeah. I, what I, I, so what I would do is I'd walk up to the front and I'd say, "So I've already pulled the wallet up, and now I've heard this." I would say, <laughs> "Um." <laughs> If, do I get a break? If I buy like half that long box over there that you're never selling, if I buy that, <laughs> box, can you give me a break on this, and then then I then I'll definitely read it. That's where you put me. Mm, okay. Right so hmm. So would you? So you'll buy it with a discount. Yeah. So uh, so would you rather just go to the library and check this out then? Um, that's, if that's an option, I might. That's so that's and usually really how we liked it. Yeah, if so, I really liked it, then I would then I would go, you know, then I would be on pins and needles for what's next, and you know, yeah, so I've we, done that before with things. I've seen, like, you know, I uh, started with an audio book once at a at a library and loved it, and didn't think I was gonna. So I was like, oh, I, I told you, this is really good. So when I was done with it, I bought the second. Yeah, the second I've, book. I've done that with trades before, where I read them at the library, and yeah. then I'm like, you know what. I need to I need to buy a hardcover of this. And there is yeah. totally nothing wrong with going to the library. So we have three kind of three categories. We have um uh go out go right out in a buying frenzy and pick it up, borrow mm-hmm. it from a friend or read it at the library or skip it completely. Mm-hmm. So those are our things. And there's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with going to the library and if the library doesn't have uh ghosted in LA, ask them because the library has a budget. And many libraries today have a budget specifically for comic books. Our local library has a whole room in the in the kids section that is nothing but trade paperbacks. I mean, I was amazed when I went in and they have like all these X-Men trades. They have all these DC comic trades. They have Dark Horse and Hellboy and a bunch of stuff. So you can go to your library and say, hey, can you go get Ghosted in L.A.? They have a budget for that. And the best part is, um, you know, the the library now has something to use their budget for and they have a justification for it. Uh, also, the creators get paid from library purchases. So if you're borrowing it from a friend, that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. But um, Cena Grace and and uh, and, and the artist uh, are not going to get any money out of you borrowing it from a friend. But if you go to the library and check it out, they're going to get a, they're going to get some money back on that. So it sounds like buying or borrowing it from the library might be for you, Scott. Yeah, I'm in. I'm going to do that. I have a brand new one over here by me. I'm going to go there. There you go. Hmm. Ask them. Ask yep. them. Just go in and say, "Hey, do you guys have comic books or trade paperbacks? If not, <laughs> yeah. can you get this you know for what me?" They'll, do? they'll give me the. They'll give me that Ghostbusters thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I'm Here, glad you like that out. because, uh, if I remember correctly, <laughs> none of us we just all hated that volume. Really? Yeah. I, we, yeah. know, I got, we hated it so it much. It took me. us. It took us like two two Tuesdays to review it. Oh like, man. Yeah. Okay. We like the 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 pod, like Stephen was so sick from reading it that he canceled the podcast. Yeah. And the next day, <laughs> the next podcast we had to review it, and now we're reviewing it again. Oh God, my gosh! It, it just won't go away. Man. It's like a bad uh, penny or a bad mm. Ghostbusters episode. 
Sure. Uh, what's the one that scared you as a kid, Rodrigo? The which Ghostbusters episode? The, Who was the, the big bad? man? The Oogie Boogie Man. Yeah, well, the Boogie Man. Yeah, he oh, kind of looks man. like the Joker, but he has like cloven feet. Oh, I remember that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is creepy. Yep. It's somewhere in your nightmares. That guy's still there because that was a very creepy character to put in a kids' cartoon. The real Ghostbusters. Didn't they have an episode with actually Cthulhu? Yeah, they did. Uh, I feel yeah, like and they, crazy. They really? <laughs> I, don't I know. The, I don't know the, if they the called him came Cthulhu. Back, came back at least once. Yeah. They I will have... say this: that comic captured the voice of Dan Aykroyd as Ray pretty good. I'll say that. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. And you know what? I think Ghostbusters 1 is a classic for all time. Yeah. Ghostbusters 2 is kind of a piece of turd. So <laughs> I already don't like it, but I like Ray. And even in 2, yeah. I like Ray. And in this comic, I like Ray there. Yeah. I'm, there you go. Hmm. What do you think? How do you feel about Ray in Afterlife? Because Ray in Afterlife upset me. Uh, I have not seen Afterlife yet. I need oh. to see that. And I know he's in it, so it's not a spoiler yeah. I'd, I'd heard, but uh, oh, sorry. I, I haven't done it yet. I mean, whenever I try, whenever I see something where Dan Aykroyd is not given a great script or it's poorly whatever, I just think of Grocer from Gross Point Blank and everything's okay after that. I actually enjoyed, <laughs> I actually enjoyed Afterlife. If you haven't seen that, Scott, you need to, you need to watch that. I yeah, we keep meaning to. Kim and I, we're, so we got this, we have a list. It's embarrassing. It's full of uh, movies. I have a list. Yet. Sure. I know. It's just too much content, man. I got this. I still haven't seen Ant Man and the Wasp. I still haven't seen uh uh the one Brian's Loki. always cheesing me about Lo- or, oh yeah. No, I saw Loki. I watched Loki. Oh, okay. You watched Loki, okay. Really enjoyed it, yeah. Watch Loki. Um I haven't I still haven't seen uh Parasite. That's the one. What? Oh Parasite's sure. good. Come sure. on, Scott. I know. I know. It just sits there. And then I watch Barbarian twice and I've seen Mad Max fifteen times since yeah. I started thinking about well, there's, you know, there's, there's comfort dystopian. Oh, right. Yes. Dystopian 100%. Movies. I'll watch. I, yeah. I alternate. I watched in the last month. I've seen Dune again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had to set aside a bunch of time for that. Cause it's a long movie. I saw the, both Blade Runners, uh, the original and the 2049 again. And then I saw, um, uh, Fury Road like twice in between all that. Yeah. So, yeah, I still haven't seen the new Blade Runner. I haven't gotten around to it. Oh, it's so good. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I am very, I am very conflicted about 2049. You're crazy. It's I, awesome. I am. I mean, it captures all <laughs> yeah, of the aesthetic. Sorry. It forwards the story, yeah. but for some reason, I think one of the things, the open-ended question about who is a replicant and who isn't in the first mm-hmm. movie, I don't think needed an answer. Yes. The ambiguous ending is part of the fun. Yes. And you're not allowed to have ambiguous endings anymore. And that's... Yeah. But didn't that have... But that had a... Didn't he do a direct version of Final you've Cut seen that you, like no. made it more definitive? Like uh, I thought, they I thought, never came out to say that Deckard was a replicant. Spoiler alert, everybody! Um, I, thought Scott, I thought Ridley Scott Deckard did. was a replicant. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. If you watch twenty forty nine, it totally says yeah, Deckard's a replicant. Oh. Um, in the year twenty forty nine, Harrison yeah, Ford is so very I'm, tired. And I'm so conflicted because of that. Like all of the action mm-hmm. is really cool. Um, uh, what's his name? Gosling. I think plays a very stoic, you know, replicant who is faced with nothing but racism uh, Mm -hmm. towards the fact that everyone knows that he's a replicant, uh, I think is very interesting. I think the, the, the aspect of he wants to be a real boy is very, very interesting in this. Um, But I don't know. There's something about it that feels more sterile than the first Blade Runner movie. I can see. Oh, I don't you know, know, I loved it so much. I I don't know what it, it's something about this director, Denise Villeneuve. He doesn't mm-hmm. make bad movies. Everything mm-hmm. he makes, I just want to go <laughs> see immediately. I love Dune. I loved Arrival. I love Sicario. Yeah, they're super pretty. It's like really oh, pretty, pretty movies. movies. Yeah. yeah, beautifully yeah. filmed for sure. Yeah, and 2049. It, but I also feel this way about the original. They're they're all they're mostly aesthetic for me, and mm-hmm. less much else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm I'm 100 percent cool with that. And uh, I just feel like 2049 carried on the tradition. Yeah. I'm not saying I hated the movie. I just, I've tried to watch it like two other times since its initial release. And I'll get Mm -hmm. like to the part where he goes home after the fighting um, um, Drax. uh, Mm -hmm. After he gets the talking down by his commander and he goes home and he's talking to his uh, AI um, house, house AI. And I, right after that scene, I'm just like, okay, I'm kind of done watching the movie. You know, oh, he gets set up for his assignment and then it's just like, okay, I'm kind of done with the movie. 
Well, maybe That's, you need to watch it in installments. Maybe like, I do. I maybe I need to do, do, do a Scott Snyder I, that. Yeah, I watched Dune as a Not four-part Scott. miniseries, and it was pretty good. Yeah, you yeah, gotta, nice. if you need to, you can break that one up. In yeah. Pieces. And yeah, yeah. Sequels, sequels are hard because a, a sequel can change the original for yeah. you. Because, like, I saw Clerks three, and in the time since I've seen Clerks three, I have now watched Clerks two twice, and Clerks, which I'm good for, you know, an airing a month, probably two or three times in bits and starts, and each time I watch it, I'm like. But remember what happens in Clerks 3. Yeah. And I'm like, no, you have to put that out of your mind. You cannot let that color. But I, I almost can't yeah. not think yeah. about Clerks 3 when I'm thinking in Clerks. And it just, you know, when you uh, hear when you hear people be like, oh, this movie ruined my childhood and whatever. And, you know, people are being butts about it. Right. There's a there's a legitimate feeling behind that. There is something legit about this, because if you enjoy that story. Right. And something changes that story retroactively, you have to do work. You have to do a sort of emotional work to clear that out to continue enjoying the first one. I mean, this happened with Star Wars, right? It's like right. most people hated the prequels. Um, and and for a lot of people, like a part of the reason why people hated that so much is because it poisoned the original ones for them. Um, who knows how people feel now? Because the sequels oh, have no. basically been properly absorbed so, into the into the universe. So. I'll, I'll pull a phrase from Buffy: "Into every generation, a Star Wars trilogy is born." So for yeah. us, Scott and Matthew, and to an extent Rodrigo, uh, the yeah. original trilogy was our Star Wars, and everything after that is crap. For Zach Wolf and maybe Rodrigo, the prequels were their Star Wars when they saw when they were six, eight years old. And that's what they love. And for my kids, it's the third trilogy that they are all gung ho about. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really weird uh, to just see that happen as each generation gets its own star Wars and how they embrace it or reject. Although I will say uh, the youngest loves episode four as much as I do. So he thinks that's the best one of, of all of them. Sure. But uh, he and the, he and the boy right. both go crazy for uh, the, the, last trilogy so yeah i'm not a fan of episode four but i love the original star wars yeah um okay <laughs> well sorry scott for giving you the wrong uh, stuff but hey i think we've got a new a new thing we can do uh yeah, on the major okay. spoilers podcast going forward okay it's haunted what you did to me with this ghostbusters thing it's haunted it's mm -hmm. a perfect halloween gift yes this will this will haunt you in your in your nightmares <laughs> for for weeks now so yep uh, I know, I'm haunted, right? where can people find more of Scott Johnson stuff? I know we've already talked about the morning stream, but what else do you got going on? Well, there's tons going on. Um, I'll say this. If you like video games. Yes, we do. Uh, and good, because I got the show called core, which I air on Thursdays with my co-host, John and Bo, where we go over everything from the top level industry type news all the way down to well, some little indie game we played that week. And it's really fun uh, show. It's the most fun I've had podcasting maybe ever um just having such a blast on there you seem so to that like that like that's your new favorite show isn't it it really is a fun i mean between that and film sack it's hard to call my favorite of the of the standalone weeklies uh, those two those two kind of wrestle for top spot all the time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um but the yeah the core is just killing it right now and i'm just loving every minute of it and i'm passionate about the t subject matter so that helps are you going to get uh, a uh, are you going to get an oculus pro or whatever it is uh, so I may end up with a 10 day demo, uh, with one to see how it is. Um, I'm very skeptical of a $1,500. The thing's not really aimed at consumers anyway. It's really aimed for enterprise. Tom, um, Tom Merritt bought their, one. He did. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, I don't know. He does that stuff cause he kind of has to for, yeah, for but he's going he to, he's going to give it to Sarah for a live with it thing. And she loves uh, she's huge ER into her, for her, yeah. her, 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 the second one. Yeah. I mean, I think that device looks like a pretty impressive piece of kit. Um, there's some caveats, but again, it's, it's not really aimed at the consumer market as much as it is certainly, certainly not at that price point. Um, but we talk about that kind of stuff. We had a lot of VR talk here recently about sort of the future of it, our expectations as things start to evolve and different people get their their hands around whatever the definition of the metaverse is supposed to be we we bounce that around a lot we got legs now yeah we got legs it's like the oh, wait, thing it's really I'm sorry. it's like carpenter's thing really is what it is carpenter's uh, so thing? If you, 
Yeah, so you see like a head. I've never seen a Carpenter's thing. Oh, you got to watch Carpenter. John Carpenter's The Thing, the movie. Oh, I've seen the movie. I thought you were talking about (laughs) Carpenter's Thing. No, I know what you mean. About that little oh, like, man, that's some giant Cronen. <laughs> it's a Cronenberg, Scott. Get get on. Yeah, that. the Cronenberg, Carpenter's exactly. Thing, and it's going to be well. Cronenberg. Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford used to be a carpenter before he became an actor. So maybe there that's true. But oh wait, anyway. so I have. Never mind. Yeah, his replicant thing. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we have a ton of fun on there, and I would like people to check it out. So find Core wherever you get your podcast. That's C O R E, or you can find it at frogpants.com slash Core. There you go. And Rodrigo, where can people find more of you? Uh, if you go to Twitter for as long as that lasts, you can, uh, get at me at fearsome critter. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just check my, uh, pinned tweet. I've got, uh, my Twitch channel there. I got my YouTube channel there and uh, a bunch of other stuff. All right. And Matthew, I'm riding Twitter to the ground like the Edmund Fitzgerald. So at Mighty King Cobra, uh, if you're at any given coffee shop in central Kansas at any given point at about 7 a.m., you might see me. I'll be the fat guy in the red car. All right. And of course, so you can find all of our good stuff over at Majorspoilers.com. And that's where we're going to wrap it up for this issue. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for 1000 issues of the Major Spoilers podcast. Seemed like a pretty typical. This is a good jumping on point for everybody. Uh, if uh, you listen to this episode and you're like, huh, I wonder what the previous 999 were like, just, you just found out, but including the 20 minute side trip. (laughs) Yes. Uh, but let me, let me say this. If you found some kind of value in the show, if you, uh, uh, got a laugh out of it, if you've got some information, if our pitch to Scott to check out ghost in an LA volume one, uh, convinced you also to go check out ghost in an LA volume one. How about you come and join us on our Patreon page where we have even more fun, including the Major Spoilers podcast pre-show, where I give Scott, Matthew, and Rodrigo a recommendation of something each of them should watch. It's all different for each of them, uh, mm-hmm. but Very it's good. right up their alley. It's it's handcrafted. It's bespoke, bespoke uh, viewing for them. You can find that at the Major Spoilers podcast pre-show. Uh, you can find out more when you join us over at patreon.com slash major spoilers. So until next time, when we get into four digits and more, also Rand is back next week. Uh, we remember that we know you love comics and we do too. And we will talk with you soon. If I had the x-ray vision of a Superman, I could save a few bucks and stand around and read through the covers of the comics on the stand. But although every other page would be backwards, I suppose, I could still read the evens and the odds. Well, I don't know. Guess I haven't thought this all the way through. Plus, as soon as the comic book store guy knew, he kicked my butt out on the corner. What a major spoiler. What a major spoiler. About a better way. If I was hulking green or gray, I could just bust through that brick wall, take their comic books away. But then the little meat would deal with all the tanks and bombs and guns. Have you ever tried to read a series with all that going on? Guess I need to rethink this plan. How would I back and board my comics with such huge hands? Guess I already told ya. What a major spoiler. What a major spoiler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a major spoiler What a major spoiler It's like a man of iron I might not be surprised to find That I might actually have the heart cold To follow an entire storyline But would I really even need To read upon all those escapades I mean, who needs such distractions When your sister's such a babe But the downside is such a beast Being shot up in a fine be in the Middle East With a king sign throwing soldier What a major spoiler What a major spoiler Yeah, yeah, yeah what a major spoiler! Whoa, 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 whoa! What a major spoiler! This podcast is copyright 2022 by Major Spoilers Entertainment LLC.